Have you ever wondered if New Year's Eve could really mean something that will change your whole life? That's what we'll talk about today. Bear with me, this is a long quote. It's suspended there to remind us before we pop the champagne and celebrate the new year, to stop and reflect on the year that has gone by, to remember both our triumphs and our missteps, our promises made and broken, the times we opened ourselves up to new adventures or closed ourselves down for the fear of getting hurt. Because of what New Year's is all about, getting another chance, a chance to forgive, do better, do more, to give more, to love more, and stop worrying about the what-ifs and start embracing the what-would-be. So when that ball drops at midnight, and it will drop, let us remember to be nice to each other, kind to each other, and not just tonight, but all year long. Claire, from the movie New Year's Eve, 2012. You know, I like to do movies around the holiday times, so we will talk about the movie New Year's Eve. It starts off by showing New York. For those of you who listen to my podcast for a while, you know I'm not much of a city person. But I have to say, after getting a chance to travel to New York a couple of times and spend a few weeks there because of work, I have to say there is something magical about New York. And Stan in the movie says nothing beats New York on New Year's Eve. And one of my trips was right at Christmas time, snowing a little bit, a blizzard was coming in, and I got to walk around. I had this set walk inside of New York. Generally, when I go to a place a few times, I end up getting a standard walk that I try to explore the city a little bit. And my walk took me down Fifth Avenue, which is where you have Tiffany's and all the big stores lot of historic buildings inside of New York. Then it takes me up to Broadway, and I see all the amazing and obnoxious and wonderful things in Times Square. I make my way to Central Park, because you know if there's a tree, I'm going to go find it. And walked around Central Park. Made me think of all the movies that were filmed there, all the runs, all the things that happen in Central Park. It really is a magical place. And then I walk back up 7th Avenue, a lot more historic places. You get to see a lot of different buildings that are there, including places that you've seen in television shows like Seinfeld. So I got a big kick out of this walk. But one of my favorite memories had to be walking by 30 Rock, the ice rink, the Christmas tree, all the people bundled up in their coats and mittens. And it just was that scene right out of the movie. And that's where this movie really takes place, that amazing, magical time right before New Year's Eve. One of the tours I did was a walking tour of New York, and they took us into the Times Square New Year's Eve building. Had some histories of the ball that drops and how tiny the ball used to be and how enormous it is right now. And then when you're in this room, there's little pieces of paper all over the place. And what you can do is you can write a message to someone who might get this piece of paper. They fill the ball with paper or somehow the paper comes out as the ball drops and you see it when you're watching TV shows. You actually do see it in this movie too where there's little pieces of paper that come down. The thing you might not know is people can write messages to other people on those papers. And so I ended up writing a message of hope hoping that the next year brought something amazing and that it gave someone this idea that if it felt hopeless, there is hope out there and there's always another chance. And I think that in the end, that's what this movie is about. Each character represents an archetype of a person. We have Ashton Kutcher, hates holidays. He's also very smart. He lets you know that he is smarter than everybody. But in the end, he's just a cynic. He thinks he sees behind the curtain of the whole world and that nothing is worth anything to anyone. However, the thing he doesn't realize about it is that it's also making him a miserable person in general and a miserable person to be around. He is just cynical all the time. We meet Michelle Pfeiffer, who has dreams, 
She wants to have a happy life. She has a job she hates, and she never does the bold thing in order to make her life happen. We have Sarica Jessica Parker, who must have had her heart broken at some time, maybe has given up on love. And she's a very watching parent, cares about her daughter a great deal. Zach Efron is kind of a dude. He's sort of a happy-go-lucky guy and is a bike messenger. But when he sees someone who is in need of someone else because he knows that she needs him more than anything, he steps in and figures out how to be the hero in the story. Robert De Niro has been so bitter and angry in his life that he pushed everyone away. And now on his deathbed, there's no one to visit him. Halle Berry, the dedicated nurse who is there through thick and thin, try to make someone's life a little bit better. Catherine Hagel and John Bon Jovi had a romance, and it went bust. Misunderstandings, but she can't bring herself to forgive him, even though being without him is making her miserable. And then there's Josh Duhamel, who you can tell had his share of good-looking women that were fun and, I think, not very deep. And now he was ready, because he met someone the previous year, to have something better this year. He found that, like junk food, meeting people who may be vapid, maybe not showing their best selves on New Year's Eve, and perhaps not the right person for you, is empty calories. It's not bringing anyone to anything good. And then there's Hillary Swank, tough business person. Her job is to get that ball to come down at midnight. She's under a lot of pressure for her job, and she's under a lot of pressure that we don't know about quite yet, but she basically has her image as a tough person. She's the one who read that speech. She's the one that gave that speech that I read at the beginning of the podcast, unknown whether or not she meant any of it, because her job was on the line. She was the face in front of the entire world when the ball did not come down. And so was she saying that because she meant it? Or was she saying it because she needed to say something to get people to get off her back a little bit, to believe that that ball is going to come down? And by the way, it's Matthew Broderick who is her boss. So the movie is packed with all sorts of people. There's a lot of people who became famous after this movie, ended up in TV shows, and ended up in other types of movies. And so it's just packed full of people. I was really entertained by how many people I probably didn't know when I saw this movie for the first time that I know now. So that was kind of exciting. And I have to say, I do have a place in my heart for these movies, like Love Actually, this movie, where there's eight separate stories. I think Traffic was like this, too, that all of a sudden at the very end all come together where everyone ends up somehow being related, sort of six degrees of Kevin Bacon together at the very end of the show. I don't know. I'm kind of a sucker for that. It's a fun way to end a movie. The story with Ashton Kutcher, and his name is Randy. And again, I said he was cynical. He was not only not willing to celebrate New Year's Eve, just another day. People just go out there and get drunk and do sorts of stupid things. It's amateur night. People who don't party at all suddenly go out and party and make a fool of themselves. In fact, his quote about it said that it's party amateur hour. By him taking down all the decorations that other people put up, he is against everything. And he doesn't care if tearing society or good things that make people happy down. He sees the real world. He knows how fake it is. And he doesn't want anyone else to have a great New Year's either because he knows better than everyone. And in his time in the elevator, he ends up meeting Leah Michelle, who's from Glee, and her name is Elise. And she's supposed to sing with Bon Jovi at New Year's Eve. You can tell this is a big gig for her. It's something that she's not been able to do. And now by her being stuck in that elevator with cynical Ashton Kutcher, this was not her idea of what her breakout moment was going to be. But it's a little bit like the Grinch because her charm, her happiness, her positive outlook charmed Ashton Kutcher. And his heart grew three sizes that day. And he stopped being so much of a Grinch. That's how you break up cynicism, is you overwhelm it with things that could be. I get it. 
I think my dad was a bit of a cynic because what you do is you end up seeing through all the things. Oh, it's just another Hallmark card moment. Oh, it's just another artificial holiday. It's just another day on the calendar. There's nothing special about New Year's Eve. It's just someday when they built the first calendar, made it the first day of the year. Nothing magical about it at all. I get that. I can see that all the time. But the question is, is that we as humans are symbolic people and we put symbolism into things that maybe don't even have symbolic reasoning to them. And the question is, if it makes people happy, if it gives people the starting and stopping point where they can begin new dreams, they can give up on old bad activities, they can start looking at life with a fresh new face, why stop it? What's the point? Because if other people find meaning in it, there's no reason you have to tear it down for everyone else. And wouldn't it be a little bit more magical if you could kind of see behind that too? I always think about New Year's resolutions because, again, it's just another day. There's no reason I have to make resolutions. There's a lot of pressure at the beginning of the year. The gyms get filled with people who are signing up for gym memberships because they're going to start off on their goals. And so for the rest of us who had been going to the gym, it becomes terrible to go to the gym because it was filled with a lot of people who in approximately three weeks are going to give up on it all. But does that mean that we have to be jerks about it, that we have to think about it? Because you know what? 15% of those people who stick to it and for the first times in their lives, they lose the weight, they gain fitness, they get healthier, they get over whatever health crisis they're having. And isn't it worth it? Because some people did believe in the dream that they got there. So that's Ashton Kutcher. By the end of the movie, you can tell that he's been charmed by this whole thing. Not sure what happens to him after this movie, but we can all hope that he becomes less of a jerk and more about seeing the hope in the world around him. The other story that really charmed me the most was the story of Michelle Pfeiffer and Zach Efron. Again, Michelle Pfeiffer was working, kind of a jerk, and he was mean to her on New Year's Eve. And she just decides that she has had it. She has a chance meeting with the bike messenger, Zach Efron, who, of course, is a good-looking guy, charming, he smiles at the right points, brought some things to the office for the last moment. He tells that she's writing a list of New Year's resolutions, and she says, you better start getting working on those because that's quite the list. She walks into her boss's office, he's a jerk to her, and she does the one thing that was at the top of her list which was to quit her job. I wonder how many years she's been writing that on her New Year's resolution and never being able to do it. She later calls him back through his service and hires him for the whole day. I want you to make all my New Year's resolutions come true today. And he doesn't think he can. One of the items was to have an amazing experience she wants to go to Bali. She wants to see all the boroughs of New York. And you know what? The thing that's charming about this is, you know, in a different movie, Zac Efron would be this millionaire and he would fly her to all the places and do all the things for her. But instead, what Zac Efron does in this movie is actually quite amazing. He thinks outside the box. He takes her to a model city of New York so she can see all the boroughs. He takes her to this massage palace that is a recreation of what it looks like to be in Bali. And it's this amazing moment for her where she suddenly feels that she's in Bali getting a massage. He does all these things that are just stunning. And he says a few bad words because, again, he's sort of a bro guy. He doesn't really say <laughs> the kindest things all the time. He said something like she's a few loaves short of a picnic, you know, in that pathetic kind of way. and. She dumps him. She says, fine, you're done. And she gives him the tickets to the New Year's Eve party. That was some special thing that she got because of her work. He feels bad about it. And instead of just walking off and going and hanging out with all his friends, he finishes her list. He figures out how to give her an amazing experience. And then he takes her to that party and just lets her have a fun time. He even kisses her at midnight because he wanted her to have that perfect, New Year's Eve moment. It wasn't a romantic thing. It was a sweet thing. And so I think out of all the stories, that was absolutely my favorite piece. 
But it makes me wonder how many times we write our own resolutions, we have our own dreams for the year, and first of all, we think of them literally, so we can't get them done. Bali was out of her price limit, but she had a way of experiencing Bali through creative thinking. So it made me think too, is there a way that we could more creatively get our own dreams? And she hired someone to help her. I don't think that's a crazy idea. There are all sorts of services out there that will let you hire people who will just help you. Stuff like TaskRabbit and other types of job services who can help you make your dream come true. I think the other things to remember inside this television show is that it's worth, in the case of Josh Duhamel, to go after the true love instead of the junk food diet of relationships that don't matter. And I also think it's important to remember all the people who make special days happen. Half the people in this movie were people whose job it was to bring that special New Year's Eve experience to other people. Food staff, doctors and nurses, people who bring the ball down, people who are in charge of security and fixing elevators. Just remember that when you have that perfect, amazing holiday, there are a lot of people behind it and a lot of people working that day. And I think to give them a moment of thanks, either in person or in our prayers, to remember the people who make things special. At the very end, the woman who is Hilary Swank decides to go be with her dying father, Robert De Niro, one last time. He wasn't going to make it out of the night. His dream was to go to the top of the hospital building and see the ball drop one last time, despite the fact that he admitted he ticked everyone off who loved him ever in his life. She showed up, and she snuck him out of the hospital and brought him up there, and they spent the night together. The hospital wouldn't let it happen, bring sick people to the top of the building. But you know what? He was dying. He wasn't going to live the night. So to have that special father-daughter moment in the name of forgiveness and throwing out old bygones and loving people and giving them that one last dream, I think that was special too. And here was an ending quote to the movie. This comes from Sam, Zach Efron, who says, Sometimes it feels like there are so many things in the world we can't control. Earthquakes, floods, reality shows. But it's important to remember the things we can, like forgiveness, second chances, fresh starts, because the one thing that turns the world from a longing place to a beautiful place is love. Love in any of its forms. Love gives us hope, the hope for a new year, and that's what New Year's Eve is to me. Hope and a great party. So my challenge to you, while you're thinking about what you want the next year to be, what you think the last year was to you. I want you to write down three things that you always wanted to attain, even if they were somewhat foolish. And then think outside the box. Are there different ways that you can accomplish the same goal, even maybe if you can't get there the same path? All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Happy New Year's Eve. I hope you have a wonderful end of your year. And I hope you have a magical, amazing start of a new year. It's just another day in the calendar, but we can turn it into a starting point of something great. And remember that getting to that something great starts with small steps.